Okay, we should be good to go now. So thank you everyone for joining us again, as Jeanette said. Um, today's our third wellness workshop of the summer. So we'll be talking about healthy sleep habits. Just to reintroduce ourselves, my name is Mia. And then we also have... Angie. Nicole. And Cecilia. Mm -hmm. So to any new folks that are joining us this week, we're first and second year occupational therapy students working with the Emeriti Center for the summer, providing wellness workshops and consultations on various wellness related topics. And so our topic for today is going to be providing a introductory overview on sleep routines and healthy sleep habits. And then if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, feel free to unmute but we will also have a designated time at the end for questions as well. So our objectives for today are to differentiate between REM and non-REM sleep and understand the sleep-wake cycle, um, understand how sleep deprivation affects older adults and how occupational therapy plays a role in helping with sleep. And we'll be further defining sleep hygiene and learn about how you can develop a healthy sleep routine. This is our agenda for today. Um, so to, we're going to be doing a brief overview on sleep for our first um, part of the agenda. Um, in the middle of our presentation, we'll be discussing sleep deprivation and occupational therapy's role. Then we'll delve into the term sleep hygiene and discuss some tips and strategies to attain a good night's rest. So before we get started, we wanted to start with a quick true or false game. I'm gonna read off a statement and a poll will pop up and please take your best guess on whether you think the statement is true or false. So our first statement is, many older adults need five or less hours of sleep per night. So go ahead and answer that poll. Give it a couple of seconds. I think we got about, almost about everyone. We can end the poll, Mia. And okay, are you able to view results? Yes. <laughs> the results, majority of you, I said false. And it is false. So according to the National Institute of Aging and National Sleep Foundation, older adults should get between seven and nine hours of sleep per night. So for our next statement, your body gets used to getting less sleep. So go ahead and answer true or false. Almost everyone participating. Give a couple more seconds for those last few folks who want to answer the poll. I think we're about there. We can end the poll now. So a little bit more split on this time, about 78% false and 22% said true. So let's show the answer. And the answer is false. Research has found that a lack of sleep can take a toll on both your short and long-term health, demonstrating that your brain and body can't just get used to getting less sleep. Okay, so for the next true or false question, the question is, uh, true or false, your brain is awake during sleep. Okay, it looks like the majority of you all answered, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And it is true. Uh, the br brain remains active during sleep. The brain has different patterns um, of activity changes during different sleep stages. And in rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, the brain activity is at a level that has similarities with wakefulness. Uh, 
All right, so next question, true or false? If you can't sleep, it's best to stay in bed until you fall back asleep. All right, it looks like a decent amount of people have answered this question if you want to go to the answer. All right, so the answer is false um, and we're pretty split on this one. So if you have trouble falling asleep within the first 20 minutes, experts recommend getting out of bed instead of tossing and turning in bed. It's better to get up and do something relaxing in a quiet, dim setting and then try to go back to bed. All right, uh, so that's going to wrap up our true or false section. Thank you so much for playing. Next, we're just going to give a quick introduction to sleep. So sleep is an important occupation that we all engage in on a daily basis. Sleep is an essential part to our bodies as it affects our physical and mental functioning. It is, an, it is essential for maintaining our mental health as one poor night of sleep can affect our mood the next day. Getting an adequate amount of sleep is needed for proper cognitive and behavioral functions. When we get a good night's sleep, we can be more alert and it's easier to learn, problem solve, and making decisions can be easier. So on the other side of this, when we do not get enough sleep, our brain performance can suffer. It also helps our ability to fight diseases as well as reduce the risk of diseases and can help all aspects of our health. There are two basic types. The REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, and we have the non-REM sleep. A person cycles through all stages of REM and non-REM sleep several times during the average night, with increasingly longer and deeper REM cycles occur toward the morning hours. REM sleep is about 90 minutes after falling asleep and occurs 25% of the night. Our bodies are immobile and our breathing becomes irregular and faster as well as a higher heart rate. Most of our dreams occur during REM sleep, but some may occur during non-REM sleep. It is important to get uninterrupted sleep to get the REM sleep. And so we have now our non-REM sleep, which is our quiet sleep that lasts for about 75% of the night. And non-REM sleep has three different stages. The stage one is the changeover from wakefulness to sleep. Stage two of the non-REM sleep is a period of light sleep before you enter into the deeper sleep. And stage three is a period of deep sleep that you need to feel refreshed in the morning. So circadian rhythms are 24 hour cycles that are part of our body's internal clocks that helps carry out essential functions in our body. One aspect of this helps you control your daily schedule for sleep and being awake. Circadian rhythms are influenced by light and dark, as well as other factors. The brain receives signals from your surrounding environment, and it then activates certain hormones, alters your body temperature, and regulates your metabolism to either keep you awake and more alert or draw you to a sleepier state. If your circadian rhythm is properly aligned, it can promote consistent and restorative sleep, but when it is thrown off, it can create some sleeping problems. One of the most important well-known circadian rhythms is the sleep-wake cycle. We all have a sleep-wake cycle, which refers to the schedule of when a person is asleep or awake during each 24-hour period. Each person's exact timing of the sleep-wake cycle is unique and dynamic. When the sleep-wake cycle works properly, it can help people get approximately seven hours of sleep at night and stay awake for around 17 hours during the day. The sleep-wake cycle can be affected by age, genetics, and lifestyle factors. Our sleep-wake cycles can be disturbed, which can cause sleeping problems. So similarly to the sleep-wake cycle, we also have something called the sleep drive, which is basically each individual's personal need and pressure for sleep. So the sleep drive builds up in our body from the time we wake up throughout the day. 
Um, so if you can see here in this graphic, once you wake up, your sleep drive or sleep pressure begins to kind of increase. And it'll continue increasing, particularly with cognitively or physically demanding activities in your day. So there are aspects in your daily routine that might kind of decrease that or set that back. So for example, naps. Um, if you have a nap in the middle of your day, that might decrease your sleep drive a little bit. Um, and so just kind of the things that we do throughout our day either increase or decrease our sleep drive, ultimately leading us to then feel the need for sleep at the end of the day. So now we're gonna be talking about sleep difficulties. And to begin, we have a quick poll for all of you. How many hours of sleep did you get last night? Thank you so much for sharing your answers. I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. So um, a big majority of you get between five to eight hours of sleep, while there is a small percentage with four or less. Interesting. I'm sorry you didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be discussing sleep deprivation in older adults. And someone in the chat asked the question, what is an older adult? So older adults are usually classified as the ages of 60 and older. So um, older adults have significantly higher rates of sleep difficulty than younger age groups. It's estimated that about 40 to 70% of older adults have problems sleeping. It's common for older adults to experience changes in the quality and duration of their sleep. Many of these changes occur due to changes in the body's internal clock, as um, Cecilia touched upon. Additionally, changes in production of hormones, such as melatonin and cortisol, may also play a role in disrupted sleep in older adults. As people age, the body secretes less melatonin, which is normally produced in response to the darkness, and that helps promote sleep by coordinating the circadian rhythm. Because a lack of sleep can lead to many chronic diseases and illnesses, older adults are at risk for the following. So high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, increased fall risk, and impaired cognitive functioning. It's extremely important to address these risks and improve one's sleep hygiene routine in order to improve their lifestyle. One sleep disruption that we wanted to touch on that can be particularly common for older adults is nocturia. So nocturia is the occurrence of waking up at least once per night to use the bathroom. And so if anyone experiences this, they can imagine it, this does have a big interruption to your sleep cycle, makes falling back asleep difficult, um, and it can interrupt at any stage of your sleep cycle. So one thing to prevent nocturia is to stop drinking fluids two to three hours before sleep. Um, we wanna make sure that you're still hydrating, so making sure to hydrate earlier on in the day, the morning and the afternoon, um, but trying to limit or decrease the amount of fluids that you're drinking in those two to three hours before bed can help address this. Um, and then also, if you are experiencing consistent nocturia where you're consistently waking up more than once per night, definitely we want to encourage you to speak to your doctor about this because um, there could be other factors involved. So if you are struggling with sleep, um, we have a few recommendations. So the first would be to track your symptoms using a sleep diary. A sleep diary can pinpoint day and nighttime habits that may contribute to your problems at night. Keeping a record of your sleep patterns and problems will also prove helpful if you eventually need to see a specialist. So um, what you can include in a sleep diary includes the time you went to bed and woke up, the amount of hours you went to sleep, a record of time that you, you spent like spent doing activities such as like going up to exercise, what you eat for dinner. Um, and in tangent with that, like the types and amount of food, liquids, caffeine, or alcohol you consume before bed, your mood, and any drugs or medications you've taken. Um, the details can be important and reveals how certain behaviors can be ruining your chance to get a good night's rest. Um, after keeping a sleep diary for, for a week, for example, you may notice that you may have um, one more, more than one glass of wine in the evening, and then you wake up during the night. Um, the second recommendation would be not to rely on over-the-counter counter medications. For example, Benadryl and NyQuil. 
Um, current research notes that over-the-counter medications can be more harmful than helpful. The side effects of the medication in influencing your mood and behavior. I just want to, um, and for the third, uh, reaching out to your primary care physician for the appropriate referral. I just want to emphasize that occupational therapists focus on guiding a client towards optimal sleep performance, whereas somnologists or sleep doctors, sleep specialists, um, can prescribe medications and run tests. If you're experiencing insomnia or other sleep-related difficulties, please consult your primary care provider for a referral to the appropriate party. Some occupational therapists specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy interventions for sleep and insomnia. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is a structured program that helps you identify and replace thoughts and behaviors that cause or worsen sleep problems with habits that promote sound sleep. Unlike sleeping pills, CBTI can help you overcome the underlying causes of sleep problems. And now we're gonna talk about occupational therapy and sleep. So occupational therapy interventions focus on promoting optimal sleep performance. In 2008, the American Occupational Therapy Association's occupational therapy practice, practice framework reclassified rest and sleep as its own area of occupation, no longer categorizing it as an activity of daily living. Occupational therapists can help analyze and modify an individual's environment and lifestyle to help them find a routine that best suits their needs. Some examples of how OT can help are educating clients and caregivers on sleep misconceptions and expectations, modifying the environment, including noise, light, temperature, and bedding, and encouraging health man beha management behavior behaviors such as smoking cessation, reduced caffeine intake, a balanced diet, and adequate exercise. Another question that commonly comes up is naps. So for some people, naps can be very beneficial. For some people, they can have an impact on their sleep throughout the nighttime. So in general, naps can reduce fatigue, increase alertness, increase relaxation, and improve mood. But for some people, naps can really have an impact on their nighttime sleep. Um, so if you are going to nap, the recommendation is to keep naps short, so about 20 minutes long, um, and to keep them before 3 p.m. Because if they are too late, again, they might decrease that sleep drive and especially later in the afternoon or evening that might have a bigger effect on your sleep in the nighttime um, and again naps affect everyone differently so if you are someone that does nap and you're finding that you are having trouble sleeping at night definitely reconsider those naps um, that might be something that's impacting and for some people naps may have no impact on their sleep at night so really it's kind of up to each individual Okay, so for the remainder of the presentation, we'll be focused on sleep guidelines and healthy strategies to implement in your routine to maintain consistent high quality sleep. So what is sleep hygiene? Sleep hygiene is a general term that refers to the healthy habits, behaviors, and environmental factors that contribute to sleeping well on a regular basis. Good sleep hygiene aids in falling asleep and staying asleep, whereas poor sleep hygiene can be attributed to experiencing persistent low quality sleep. So there are many factors in our day that contribute to a good night's sleep, and some of these events may occur uh, several hours before you have any thoughts about laying down for the night. Here's a timeline that shows guidelines of how to prepare for bed. So starting with sticking to a routine sleep schedule, it's important to maintain a regular sleep schedule that does not vary more than 30 minutes to one hour. And yes, that even includes the weekends. Drastically inconsistent sleep negatively impacts uh -huh. the body's natural oh. internal clock. Okay, this was on the printer. Next, um, avoid intake of caffeine four to six hours prior to bed. Caffeine is a stimulant that energizes the body, therefore beverages such as coffee, green tea, and soda should be avoided closer to bedtime. Um, as Mia mentioned, consumption of other liquids such as water or herbal tea should be avoided at least two hours prior to bedtime to avoid sleep disturbances related to urination. 90 minutes prior to bedtime, it's recommended that vigorous exercise should be avoided. Examples include strength training, running, or a game of basketball. 
Exercising in the morning or early afternoon is a simple solution to this issue. Additional alternatives can be participating in light activities such as yoga or a regularly paced walk. I would like to note that um, late night exercise does not negatively impact every person's sleep, so it's important to assess what works best for your personal needs. 30 minutes before bed, use of electronic devices should be discontinued. This guideline focuses on blue light devices such as TVs, cell phones, and laptops because the blue light is believed to inhibit melatonin production, which is a hormone that causes us to feel drowsy. 15 minutes prior to bedtime, you can consider participating in a nightly sleep ritual. Activities such as journaling, reading, stretching, or taking a shower can help relax your body and indicate to the mind that it is time for bed. So now we would like to ask you all to share what is one thing you like to do to prepare for sleep? So feel free to unmute yourselves or comment in the chat. Um, an example of this could be something like reading a book or uh, stretching. I'm seeing take a hot shower, use the Calm app. <laughs> Someone said reading a boring book. <laughs> Lots of reading. Ooh, washing your face, that's a good one. That's part of my nighttime ritual as well. Lots of reading. All right, great. Thank you all for sharing. Okay, so creating a healthy sleep environment. In order to optimize your sleep environment, consider the following. Turn the lights off completely or dim them if needed. Reduce the sound in the room and reduce the temperature in the room. So setting the thermostat between 60 to 67 degrees is the optimal suggested temperature. Select bedding and pillows that are both supportive and comfortable and make sure to wash your bedding regularly. Keep your sleeping environment clean and clutter free. Make sure not to utilize your bed for things such as working or eating. Uh, your bed should only be utilized for intimacy and sleep. And we wanna conclude with some resources to help you kind of get started on optimizing your sleep routine. Um, so one resource that might work well for people is white noise. So I know someone just mentioned the Calm app. Um, so that's one app that kind of has a variety of white noise and different sound clips kind of to promote calming and sleeping. Also, sound machines can help do this as well without the use of electronics. Um, also, if you're someone that listens to podcasts, either on your phone or computer, there are a variety of podcasts that are dedicated to just white noise and various kind of calming audio clips as well. So for example, this is on the just Apple podcast app. I typed in white noise and these are all of them that popped up. I personally have used this first one, the relaxing white noise to both sleep and to study. And that's been really helpful for me. Other resources include sleep trackers. So this was mentioned before, but to kind of help log how much, how many hours you're sleeping throughout the night, what activities you're doing in the day, caffeine intake, things like that, to really get a visual of all the things that may be impacting your sleep. And I think we'll be able to drop a sleep log in the chat right now for your reference. Also the use of eye masks, for example, um, this might be useful if you're not able to fully have a dark room or maybe you're sleeping at different hours in the day. And then also, I know Nicole mentioned this already, but we do have occupational therapists that are certified in doing um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So specifically through our USC OT faculty practice, we do have a lot of OTs that are able to do this. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, you can connect with us and we can help connect you with those resources. Um, and there's also plenty of further research to be done. Um, we do have, if you are looking for more in-depth or more detailed information regarding sleep, we do have a presentation that we can provide you with done by an OT in our program, um, I think previously with the Emeriti Center. So we can also provide you with that presentation as well in the chat. Okay, so um, 
Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to highlight our upcoming summer uh, workshop schedule. So we have two workshops left. On July 14th uh, at 1 p.m., we have our first in-person workshop. We'll be discussing the importance of staying active and eating healthy. Uh, this session will include two different activities. One will involve stretching and light physical activity. So we recommend that you wear comfortable clothes. And the second activity will be involving creating a customized healthy snack. So for those unable to attend in person, we'll be uploading a recording um, of the material to our website. And then our final uh, workshop is going to be on July 28th at 1 p.m. And that will be uh, discussing home safety. All right, so here's our contact information and please feel free to stick around if you have any questions. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for joining us today. I think there's a few different questions in the chat that came in towards the end. So we're hoping to verbally talk through those last couple if um, people wanna hang back. I saw Jeanette, your question about how disruptive is it if you go to bed at different times each night? Um, great question. It depends on, I think, a lot of things that relate to sleep or any sort of things that you're trying to maybe modify. It depends on how much of an issue it is for you, right? If you're not having a hard time sleeping, if you're generally a pretty good sleeper, you're not noticing that there's a lot of difference um, between when you go to bed um, every night and the quality of sleep that you're getting. If you're happy with that and it's working for you, great. But if you're somebody who is noticing that you're struggling with both sleep onset, sleep quality, duration, those types of things, then definitely want to have a better understanding of what could be contributing to that. Um, so a key thing relating to sleep is called conditioned arousal, right? So it's why we talk about it's so important to use your bed only for certain things. It's also why we want our body to pay attention to going to bed at certain times. And so that's why it's recommended very often typically to not modify your sleep routine by more than you know 30 minutes or even an hour feels like a little bit long, but not to modify it too much from night to night is because you're disrupting your body's ability to very naturally and easily fall into that conditioned arousal of like, this is the time that my body goes to bed. I know it goes to bed every single time, every night. I don't have to worry or think about it or force it, right? Sleep should not be a forced thing. Um, it's very difficult or impossible to force sleep. There are things we can do to optimize it, but it is more of a conditioned arousal that our body should be getting used to. Anything beyond that though, right? If there are exceptions to that process, um, if you are having more sleep disturbances, there could be things that would be going on within your body that would warrant following up with the sleep doctor, doing a sleep study, those types of things. Does that answer your question, Jeanette? The why behind it, okay. I think there are maybe a couple other questions in the chat. So using earplugs, okay. Um, yes, earplugs can be perfectly fine to help mute, um, especially if you're living in a loud environment to help mute that um, can be a really nice, low cost and easy uh, type of thing. I know for me, it tends to make my sleep a little bit worse because I get angry in the middle of the night. If I've lost my earplugs, they've fallen out and I feel agitated. Um, so again, you just want to think about, is this working for me or is it making me making my sleep a little bit worse? So for me, that's why I tend to prefer a white noise machine, something that's not going to fall out of my ear in the middle of the night and make me feel agitated and angry, knowing my own responsiveness and my own triggers in the middle of the night. Let's see. Uh, also a question about best type of mattress or pillow material. Oh, great question. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that really does depend, right? Are you a stomach sleeper? Are you a side sleeper? Are you a back sleeper? There are different indications for how you tend to position yourself as you're sleeping in the middle of the night and what your sleep preferences are. And also what are the sleep issues that you're experiencing? So for example, if you're having a lot of head and neck pain, you wanna really look at having a different type of pillow, maybe something that's gonna offer you more support and more structure, right? Something that's gonna feel a little bit firmer. Um, and more contoured to that part of your body than other um, types of pillows. So there's no, I would say in my experience, um, there's no one thing that is going to suit everybody with regards to a certain type of material or that's gonna work for a pillow or even for a mattress. Um, it really is unfortunately one of those things where you do have to try out several different options. I've had some people 
maybe myself included, where a rolled up towel under the back of my neck provides the right amount of cervical support, that's going to be my best go-to mode for, for sleeping. It's not even a pillow, right? It's just kind of back there. It's going to support my neck. It actually helps me get the best night's sleep. So unfortunately, it is one of those trial and error types of things. Uh, adjustable beds for COPD or sleep apnea. I would defer to, again, like a sleep doctor around the recommendations. If you have a diagnosis of something, um, so for example, sleep apnea, I would check with your doctor about what their recommendations are for anything that is specific to a diagnosis um, as well. Uh, let's see, question from Joanne about recommending a 20 minute nap and not more. Ooh, great question. Um, so with naps, what that has to do with is when you are taking a nap, um, uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, when Mia was talking about sleep drive, right? We're going through our day, we're burning energy. So we're, we're burning something called adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and it produces this um, byproduct called adenosine, which builds our drive for sleep during the day. So as we're expending energy, we have more of that adenosine that's building up in our body and it's helping us to prepare for sleep. So if you take a nap, as Mia was saying, you clear away some of that adenosine. So there's less sleep pressure building up at the time that you would normally be going to bed. So when it comes to naps, what we want to do is we know that um, a 20 minute nap, right, is going to allow us enough time to clear just enough of that adenosine to sort of optimize our functioning, but it's going to prevent us from going into those deeper phases of sleep. Um, if I'm working with somebody and they're like, oh, I, I'm okay with a 30 minute nap, that works for me, I'm still feeling and waking from my nap feeling fresh and restored, that's great. But if you're waking from that 30 minute nap starting to feel a little bit groggy, a little bit cranky, right, that then we know you're probably a 20 minute nap person because at that 30 minute mark, you flipped over into a deeper stage of sleep. So we wanna make sure that you're cutting your nap off into that lighter phase of sleep. So you're clearing just enough adenosine, but without pushing your body into a deeper phase of sleep. Does that make sense, Joanne? Yes, so okay. thank you so much for clearing that up. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Yes, Eric, your body likes routine. Absolutely, we wanna have a good healthy routine with that. Um, any other questions from the chat? I'm kind of catching up. Oh, um, how sleep may change with menopause. Um, I won't go necessarily into a ton of detail here just for the sake of time, but absolutely, your hormones play a big piece in your um, sleep. In particular, your circadian system is very hooked up to our horm hormones. Um, hence the, the um, endocrine system can be a problem. This is why we also tend to see more women than men have issues with insomnia is due to hormonal changes. For example, menstruation, um, menopause, those types of things. There are certain approaches that can be used to work with those hormonal imbalances um, uh, as well that take that into consideration. So if you are struggling with that piece, I would certainly recommend that you um, either connect with a sleep doctor or that you maybe reach out to our occupational therapy faculty practice, which is where I work, um, to one of our therapists um, who, like myself, have been trained in um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and have additional training and expertise in working with folks on sleep disorders. But that's just in a snapshot why we usually notice those hormonal changes do impact sleep. Uh, excessive yawning mean a lack of sleep or something else? Um, could be related to a lack of sleep, but it could also just mean that your mirror neurons are working in your body. It's why we might see an effect, right? Where if you see somebody yawning, you might be at increased risk of yawning because you've seen them yawn and it's sort of this, you know, responsiveness that means your mirror neurons are working. Um, so it could be, but it could also just be that you are tired. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm seeing a question, but this is a direct message to me that I'll get back around to as well. Ooh, side effects concerning Benadryl, yes. Um, so definitely want to encourage people to be careful about using anything over the counter to help you with sleep, um, as there can be unintended side effects. Um, and using CBD as well. Um, 
I'm probably going to defer to my pharmacy colleagues to speak about those things specifically. I, I can speak sort of on their behalf. I work with a lot of pharmacists and I know there's sort of thoughts and perspectives about that, but I know we also have a pharmacist who's gonna be coming later this summer, I believe the first week of August, right, Jeanette, who I will defer to Dr. Taban's expertise on speaking to um, CBD and its impact on sleep in detail. But if you have questions about those things for your sleep, I would certainly make sure to talk about them with your doctor before you start using anything um, as well. Same with melatonin supplements. Um, you know, melatonin is one of those things, and I've heard, um, again, interesting sort of conflicting information from a wide variety of providers that I've worked with through the years. I know some of them are much more on the side of like, it doesn't hurt, let's try it. You know, it's a relatively innocuous type of thing to introduce. And other people who are like, the dosage of melatonin doesn't make sense. It's probably not doing anything for you. Um, so again, I would make sure talk to your doctor. And also going back to why are you using these things in the first place? What are you struggling with with regards to your sleep, right? Is it sleep onset? Is it sleep duration, right? Because certain things will only help with um, particular parts of any sort of sleep disturbances that you're experiencing. So I think having a clear understanding of what are you struggling with with regards to sleep, um, and then talking to either your doctor or, you know, your um, occupational therapist or another person who is a certified, who um, has additional training in you know, insomnia and sleep disorders about those kinds of details. And then looping back around to, there was a question about to bring the temperature down in the summer. Yes, would definitely recommend air conditioning, fans, anything that you can do to try to cool your environment as much as possible um, as well. Any additional questions or comments from folks? Piggybacking off of Dr. Hall, I just read a paper recently that said that the optimal temperature for a room for sleep is between 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, depends on what people have at their disposal, not always possible, but if you can, we recommend going for it. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I've observed some bed mattresses are like, I think they're memory foam mattresses, but they, they actually make me hot and therefore I don't sleep yeah. very well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a fan of the old fashioned, just straightforward mattress, you know, without the pillow tops and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great point. Definitely um, the material uh, that either a mattress or a pillow can be made of can certainly increase or impact your, your temperature as you're sleeping, right? That's such a great point, Scott. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, if no other questions and comments, we can probably wrap things up there. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much, Professor Hall and our graduate students. Uh, we're so happy that you could join us today and we look forward to seeing you either in person or on Zoom in exactly two weeks. And what Professor Hall was talking about is we're gonna have a panel on August 1st and it will include uh, Professor Hale, Professor Patrick Tabon and, a, and a, a physician's assistant whose name I can't remember. Uh, do you happen to? Teresa Sievers Tashada, yes. Terrific. So that will be a perfect time to ask lots of questions when we have this uh, series of experts on this panel, and that will uh, start another kind of wellness uh, series. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Again, thanks to the students. Good work. And we will have this uh, posted very soon for you. So take care, everyone. <laughs>